turned it in last week, and everything I turned back tonight are papers that I had prior to today when I received a ton of them here and some in, uh, via email. If you turned a paper in or you sent it to Jeannie and you didn't get it back tonight, you need to see me. All right, is anybody on that list? Our self-reflection papers? We no, no, no. I'm talking about your course paper. Oh, okay. Self-reflection. No, I'm talking about the course paper for this paper that the papers oh. are due tonight. Yeah, okay. Uh, I don't have anybody down. I have a couple people down for extensions, that, but I gave, I think, I think I graded 10 of them. Uh, did anybody turn, not get a paper back tonight that turned it in in the last? You turned, you turned it in. When did you turn it in and how did you turn it in? Did you email it or did you? You brought it in? Okay. Uh, I will double check in on that. But, uh, anybody else? Okay. We're not talking about the self-reflection now. We're talking about the course paper, the, the, the assignment. Okay. All right. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is, uh, a, a, I call it a brief lecture. We'll probably do our break about 15 minutes earlier than we usually do so that we can devote the second half of the class to uh, the group presentations uh, and, and talking you know, over your, with your groups, however you want to do your presentation. You've got about 12 minutes or so in the second half of the class, maybe a little bit more. So the sooner we, we wrap up with this first part of the, the lecture, then, then the better off we're going to be. Um, if your paper is not, just going back to that for a second, if your paper is not in the pile tonight and you haven't talked to me about an extension, you need to see me tonight, okay? Because that's, uh, that's, that's really important that you, that you do that. Now, next week is our last class, and next week is a theological reflection. What the Watertown group is going to do is, uh, because I'm doing both classes next week, uh, doing the Watertown one on Monday night, it's going to do a Last Supper sort of thing. Uh, they're doing pizza, wings, and a cake. That's and we're going to join as a, what? That's the Last Supper. So a, I, 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 I call it the Last way Supper. Go. Kind of thing. <laughs> sure sounded that way to me. You know, Better than get together red for wine. A, a farewell yeah. kind of thing. I thought, well, <laughs> Jesus probably said the same thing to the apostles. Hey, let's get together. It's for bread. Supper. Uh, so they're going to do um, pizza and wings and soda and all that stuff. And then for the last 40 minutes or so, I'm going to do a theological reflection on the pastoral cycle. Uh, that'll tie things up. If you folks want to do the same thing, that's fine. But you need, we need to put a couple of minutes into planning that now because the food won't show up on its own. <laughs> <laughs> So what, what's your druthers? You want to do the same thing? Tammy, can we do glazier hot dogs and bring them in with french fries? Um, really? Uh, would anyone like glazier, glazier hot dogs with deep fried real french fries? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, then. Well, well, this is like church. Why don't we go watch the hockey game? Because if you don't want that, then why don't we have something else? No. Hockey game. Okay, so you're saying you're going to prepare the food, right? Can we help me? I'll come early. I promise I will. <laughs> All right. So we'll have glacier hot dogs. And what are they? I will make them. I've never had glacier hot dogs. Oh, 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 oh it'll be your last supper. <laughs> 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 I know it's been three times. No, there are. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 It may be a last supper. I've been in the one last supper. You want a donation for some larger wine? Rolls. Can someone bring in rolls? Can I bring wine? Well, bring wine? well bring wine? you listen, better make a list. Uh, you can't just say here. somebody wants it. If you want reimbursement for those things, that's fine, because we're paying, the diocese is paying for the, the food in uh, Watertown, so just bring, well, a, bring water a receipt, we'll bring a receipt, and I'll just reimburse you for it. We'll, we'll take care of it. Okay. Then never mind, I'll just get off. Cindy said wine. Can I bring wine? It's up to you. No, seriously, if you want to do that. We'll bring enough for everybody. Hot dogs? Yeah. Whoa. Wine and hot dogs. Wine and hot dogs. Don't get loaded and then do a, 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 a reflection. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So, uh, <laughs> if you're, if you're, if you're, yeah, if you're, if you're going to bring if you're going to bring wine, that's fine as long as there's no parish rules against that. I can't imagine. Michigan's not on here. I'll make it. Just do it to remind me. Yeah, we can't sell that. They didn't say we can't drink it. We just can't sell it. Right. Exactly. Then I won't buy it. I'll break it. All right. So that's does that sound like a plan? And then we'll, 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 we'll same time uh, prayer is at same time, six o'clock. We'll do like a dinner. Maybe we'll put the tables in a different configuration because nobody wants to sit and eat a dinner looking at the back of somebody's head. <laughs> so maybe we'll put them in one big square out here. We'll still set this up and I'll use this afterwards for the reflection. Okay. Sound good? Sound like a plan? Great. All right. So that's what we'll do. Uh, all right, so let's let's open tonight by saying this prayer together because I think it ties in with what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is solidarity. Come, Holy Spirit, when I have our minds to know the truth of Christ, encourage our hearts to love the truth of Christ, strengthen our wills to live the truth of Christ. We ask you through Christ our Lord. Amen. We saved solidarity for last, and, and just to bring you kind of in a way of a summary, where we have been these past few weeks is we, we began very appropriately talking about the life and dignity of the human person, the call to family, community, and participation, rights and responsibilities, option for the poor, the dignity of work and rights of workers, and then we moved the care of creation into the, the fifth slot, really, so that Sister Bethany came and did that class. And so now we wrap with, with solidarity. Uh, looking at these issues, um, looking at your papers and looking at these issues, for the most part, the first 10 papers that came in, you, you did a good job uh, looking at the, the Catholic social issues, the social ills, if you will. The assignment asked you to look at an issue that touched your own person, your, your, your heart, and uh, really brought some emotions out of you. And then it asked you to look at it on an interpersonal level and a personal level. Uh, as I said to you the last couple of weeks, what we're really looking for there is, can you, can you identify the issue that you faced? Can you attach the social justice issue to it? And then can you propose strategies that allowed you to deal with it? Uh, not just as a Catholic, but, but as a Christian. What's happened in the papers, I think, is what we, we typically find when we talk about Catholic, Catholic social teaching. And that is it's easier to fall back on what I believe is a person rather than attach Catholic <clears throat> social teaching or Catholic social justice to it. Right? So in other words, if I faced a painful situation, it has wounded me. Uh, I feel wounded, or I have observed someone else being wounded. And I can describe that situation, and I can propose strategies or actions that should be taken to right this wrong. But many of you in writing the papers did not name any of these issues, even after spending two months with them. You went to scripture, and some of you went to some very nice outside sources, but you didn't say, this bothered me because I thought it was a violation of life and dignity of the human person, or I thought it was failing in their area of rights and responsibilities, or I felt it was a failure to treat the poor. All right, that's the first thing. The second thing is, with, with only one or two exceptions, did anybody reference the documents that are in your book? The, the papal documents that we've been talking about, Rerum Novarum, which we spent a lot of time on, but Pachina Terrace, Peace on Earth, and some of those, and all the other ones that lead up to that, Quadragissimo Anno, Centratissimo Anno. Those documents are our Catholic social teaching. So, no, I don't expect you to take your papers back and run, run home and, and fill them <laughs> in and do it differently. But I mention this because as ministers, whether you're paid or not, when the bishop sends you forth, he sends you forth to be a minister in your church. 
it is not a credential, I'm a great person because I passed these courses and the bishop thinks I'm a good person and he's sending me out to do this wonderful work. It's not accreditation, it's ministry. And you represent the church. And so whatever you do in the area of social justice, whatever strategies you propose in your papers to say, you know, this will make this a lot better if we had this, or if we do this, make sure it ties back to what your church teaches. Otherwise, you're going off on your own. And, and, it's, and it's a tough path to go with. Why? Because when we look at social justice issues, we're, we're up against the world realities that challenge these very principles that we've been spending the last seven weeks on, or the last six weeks on. All of those principles of Catholic social teaching defy the odds, if you will, against the world, the world that we live in. All right? When we look at the problems that we have, we're looking at racism, we're looking at drug trafficking and abuse. We're looking in many places throughout the world of a denial of basic human rights. We're looking at poverty, uh, underpayment of wages, low wages. There's some of the <coughs> materialism. I mean, not just in our country, but worldwide. Whenever we hear the term global economy, beware. It's about selling stuff, folks. <laughs> it's about materialism. It is not, generally speaking, about fairness, equal distribution of goods and resources. It's usually about getting the best price for the resources we have. Uh, apathy. The biggest problem you will face in your ministry is apathy. Do people even care about what you care about? Is that what apathy means? Yes. Apathy means no feeling. Apathetic path, pathology, pathos, which is Greek for feeling, right? So if you have pathology, now you have apathy means not lack of whatever, you know. Uh, religious discrimination, class and economic divisions, corruption. In all of these things, if you go into ministry with the grand idea that your role in ministry is to eliminate all these things, <laughs> good luck. Good luck. And so we don't look at social justice, Catholic social teaching, as we're going off like an army to fight all of these things. When we're talking about solidarity, we're talking about bringing our beliefs together so that we're in opposition to all of these things. We don't necessarily have a plan or a strategy for dealing with each of these, but we know we stand together with our other Catholic brothers and sisters in being opposed to those. And what we'll talk about tonight is what reasonable strategies do we have in our faith life that address these kinds of issues. So don't, don't get it wrong to the point where you say, okay, I read the documents, I understand the Catholic social teaching, now my ministry is all about declaring war on, on all these problems. You'll burn out. I mean, there's, there's no question. So solidarity, if we were to put it in its simplest terms, is that we are all responsible, and we are just a microcosm of our church right now. We are all responsible to stand by the poor and vulnerable. We're responsible to take action to support the violation of rights. We learn more about the situations of those whose rights have been violated, and we put ourselves in their position, metaphorically and literally speaking, so that we have the capacity for understanding. We have the capacity to be a compassionate and understanding people. And that's what I've cautioned against, that as ministers, when you, when you jump into Catholic social teaching and you're looking at the documents and you're looking at the teachings and your first reaction is, well, do I agree with that or not? Or I sort of agree with that, but in my view, what the church ought to do is, you're missing the point. 
because those papal documents never end with your opinions and comments may be sent to. <laughs> it's a teaching. The virtue of solidarity, much the same. We can teach about solidarity, but John Paul II came along and said it's virtue that we are able to do this. The virtue of solidarity is not just a vague feeling of compassion, but a firm and preserving determination to commit oneself to the common good. It's a holy, sacred virtue that's acquired. So, who's had a Bible with you tonight? All right, good for you. All right, so let's go through a couple of these. And, and anybody else have a Bible on their phone or on their iPad or on their keychain or any of the kinds of things that we do today? We don't have the actual Bible anymore. Look at this. We have, to have to show that so people know what it looks like. Yeah, that's, that's a real Bible right there. That's not on any phone. It's not an e copy. Yeah, I'll take it. Just throw that Bible right over there, Ann. Don't. See, I thought, didn't I? I thought it's a Bible, actually. Yeah, well, it's a Bible. Bible. Dude, you go look up Genesis. <laughs> this was to let me go. I know. I stopped myself before you even started. I got Leviticus. Almost let the good book fly. All right. Okay, read Leviticus 19, 18. Take no revenge and cherish no grudge against your fellow countrymen. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And of course, we hear Jesus say this very same thing, doesn't he? And he breaks the Ten Commandments down to those the two greatest commandments. He harkens back to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, that you will love your neighbor as yourself. And obviously, when we get to solidarity, uh, that, that's the very essence of solidarity, that I expect, I'm expected to treat my neighbor, that means anybody, uh, as well as I would treat myself. So, so very important. Who's got um, Genesis 4 now? Okay. Then the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother Abel? He answered, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? What's the follow-up? What, what does God say? Then God then said, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So very, very early on in creation, this question of, am I responsible for my neighbor? I mean, we're talking about the fourth chapter of Genesis here. That's pretty early. Uh, given that there's no people until almost chapter two, we're at chapter four, we're already asking about how we should be dealing with it. So, so we're talking about solidarity. We say it goes back to the book of Genesis. It goes back to early creation. All right? Who's got Isaiah 58, 6 and 7? This is not rather the fast that I choose. Leasing those bound unjustly, untying the bonds of the yoke. Setting free the oppressed, breaking off every yoke. Okay, and so. Is it not sharing your bread with the hungry, bringing the afflicted and the homeless into your house, clothing the naked when you see them, and not turning your back on your own flesh? That's so we've got Isaiah, and that's <coughs> 750 years before Christ, right? Give or take. And, and it's a long time ago. I mean, it's almost 3,000 years ago. And there we are in Scripture talking about, essentially talking about solidarity. New Testament. Uh, let's just read a couple of these. Uh, 1 Corinthians, obviously, we're very familiar with that. Read Matthew 28. Uh, where, well, let's not, we don't have that. It'd be Matthew 25 is really the one we want to look at. This one, no distinctions, Galatians 3.28. Wow. 
about Galatians? Galatians. What is it? Chapter 3? Chapter 3, verse 28. We're familiar with this one, but let's just read it. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free person. There is not male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.28. So when we talk about globalization, we talk about that the world really doesn't have the boundaries that we've artificially put around it. You think back to Galatians 3.28, and that was so true back then. Uh, these artificial boundaries that, that, that are divisive and, and are not inclusive at all. Oh, wait, let's cover one more there, John uh, 17, 21, on unity. And I want to draw the distinction between unity and solidarity. Who's got that one? John 17, verse 21. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. As Catholics, we're not looking at those boundary lines. Right? When we look at poor, when we look at the, the poor distribution of resources and so on, we're looking at the whole planet. When we're looking at the economy. We're not just concerned about our economy. We're concerned about our neighbors <coughs> south and north of us as well. We have to think that way as Catholics. And that's where the problem comes in. This one did, for some reason, cut off up there. But, but it ties back to natural law. If you remember going back to uh, when I was talking, I think it was, I can't remember which course it was now. I'm pretty sure it was scripture uh, back in the first year. We talked about natural law. Those things that, that God just simply expects us to follow, those laws. We don't have to make up those laws. And those laws, in, when we're looking at solidarity, are that we expect all people to have access to resources. We expect all people to be fed. We expect all people to be treated justly. All the basic freedoms. And we as Catholics are locked arm in arm on these beliefs. Now, that's theoretical. That's conceptual. Because we know that in our own Catholic Church, we have differences of opinion on those things. Do we not? We have differences of opinion from diocese to diocese on capital punishment. But we need to, as ministers, have a grasp on what our church teaches us. And that we're not simply taking a course on, on uh, Catholic social teaching and then kind of going off and reshaping it in, in a way that we think makes more sense. Um, because it's because on my iPhone here uh, that it's not coming out as good. But, but these are, this was a neat little slide I found. Um, Human Rights Act. What's not to love? And if we're looking at any of these on here in the red, what could we stand up and say, I don't agree with that. No way. I don't buy into that. Prohibition of torture or degrading treatment, protection against slavery, right to liberty and freedom, right to a fair trial, freedom of thought, uh, religion and belief, freedom of assembly, free speech, uh, the right to marry, no discrimination, protection of property, right to free elections, right to education. Is there anything in there that you feel you can't stand in solidarity against? What is the no punishment? Uh, I don't know what it is. I don't have it on my phone. Oh. I don't believe that one. No punishment, <laughs> period. <laughs> <Or anything. laughs> uh, I put this up here because, quite honestly, we can spend months and years talking about Catholic social justice. The question comes down to, are we going to practice it? Are we going to live it? Are we going to do anything about it? I go back to the Bill of Rights. How much easier it is 
to draft the Bill of Rights and put it down on a piece of paper and hold it up proudly for everyone to see than it is to actually do it. And not only do it within five years of the <coughs> bill coming out, but do it 200 years later. After you've had some time to build in some conditions of what we mean by rights and who's entitled to those rights. As Catholics, as ministers, this becomes, I think, one of the greatest challenges to ministry. Is do you practice what you preach? Because it falls apart very, very quickly. So I go through, okay, so we did. It falls apart very quickly if you, if you don't look like your actions support what your church teaches. Uh, when we look at solidarity today, there's, there's often this view that it is a global connectedness. And I don't, I don't think it's that far off from that. But I think, as I said when I opened, you have to be careful when you use terms like global economy globalism, a global worldview, what do those things really mean? They're nice catchphrases, but sometimes they don't have anything to do with equality and justice. All right? They don't have anything to do with equal distribution of resources. So we have to be careful when we get into that kind of dialogue that we know what it is we're talking about. Independence versus interdependence versus solidarity. You know, do we really ascribe to be up here? Of course not. You can't be in solidarity. You can't really uh, ascribe to the teaching, the Catholic social teaching of solidarity and remain independent. Independent means you remain detached. You're not connected compassionately in any kind of way with the issue that's, that's facing you. Interdependence is just a reality. We are, in a global sense, in, in the sense of church, we should know this better than anyone, that we rely on each other. Always have, always will. Old Testament, New Testament tells us the same thing. But we're always working to get here. We're not working to get here. This one means, when we get to solidarity, we've got to give some things up. There's sacrifice to get to solidarity. Um, solidarity, the option for the poor and vulnerable. How do you really address the problem of the poor and the vulnerable? By yourself. You can't. You can't do it. You have to do it as a church. So that's why all of these issues we've been talking about the last six weeks all come become possible through this lens of solidarity because they're so huge. The care of creation. You know, Sister Bethany came a couple of weeks ago and talked about that. We can do little things toward the uh, being better stewards of creation. But we can't do it all. And when you get back to your parishes and you start ministries, you have to decide where the time is best spent. We talked about both Paul India, creation and the poor. What happens to the poor when we want to uh, use all the resources for profit. And obviously in Bhopal, India, it was a, it was a tough, uh, tough situation and continues to be. Um, just some brief, quick reflections here. <coughs> St. Teresa of Avila, Christ has no body on earth but yours. If we're looking at solidarity, then we have to understand that our actions as faithful people are the only way to get Catholic social justice done. 
You can be the most well-read person in the world. I don't care if you read the New York Times and the Washington Post and, and the, the Tribune, the Chicago Tribune, every single day and are aware of every issue. Unless you do something about it, you're no more faithful than somebody who's got nothing. It has to translate into action. Now that action can be prayer, but it has to translate into something. Knowing about it isn't the same as doing something about it. St. Francis taught us that. You've read the life of St. Francis and you realize that he was one of the saints that was geared toward action. Not talking about it, but doing something about it. St. Peter Claver. I don't know how many of you know about St. Peter Claver, but he just died recently, in 1980. He called himself the slave of the Africans. And for 40 years he fed, bathed, and brought medical aid. Really lived it. Uh, you hardly ever hear about St. Peter Claver. How many have heard about him? How many have read a book about him? One person, two people? Just a few people here that always inspired me. We must speak to them with our hands before we try to speak to them, to them with our lips. <laughs> it's almost like what St. Francis said when he preached the gospel, when necessary, use words. It's the same thing. Our actions have to define us. Our faith calls us to action, not just knowing stuff. Dorothy Day. I want to talk about solidarity. You want to talk about taking your actions and bringing them out and engaging others in that process. Dorothy Day. There's a good movie on her. It's called Entertaining Angels. Yeah, Entertaining Angels. That was awesome. Movie. I watched yeah. it. Yeah, <coughs> uh, just the whole notion of what she did, not only founding communities, those settlement houses that she founded back in, in the 30s, but the fact that the Catholic worker that she founded a newspaper that really put these views, Catholic social teaching, out in print. Sold for a nickel and still does. Uh, she was certainly a witness to the gospel. Struggled, struggled within her church. She stayed faithful, she was a convert. She struggled uh, within the church at a time when the church really didn't understand women and didn't understand that there should be an active laity doing these kinds of things. And she had an out-of-wedlock child, so that was, that was a whole other thing. And didn't she go through a period when some of the bishops in her area like shunned her? Oh, yeah. Oh, they, sure. they, they thought, you know, that's really nice. She went through a period of time when even though the Catholic worker, if you do any research on this and, and you can read some of these old articles and see the stuff that I've been teaching on the past six weeks is in the Catholic worker talking about option of the poor, talking about all of these issues. Uh, the church is branding at a communist newspaper. Why? Now well, we've come to look back with 2020 vision, but at the time, it was very difficult for Dorothy Day. And yet she stuck with it. With Peter Morin, her good friend, uh, she brought Catholic social teaching into print and into action. We found, we found in these so it kind of is a way of wrapping up. We look at all the Catholic social teaching that we've been learning the last couple of months. And we said, well, how do we live it? How do we take these teachings and actually live these teachings? And the first, you have to pray. And when you pray, you have to pray for the world, not just for our own needs. It's great to pray for our own needs and our own families and our own communities, etc. But we're looking globally at this. We've got a lot of issues facing the world right now. They're very, very challenging. And so our prayer has to involve the world. That's why each week in our prayer of the faithful, we're always looking at a global mm -hmm. petition, reminding all the Catholics in the pews that we don't just pray for our local, local folks. We're praying for the world. Um, that brings us to cultivating a more global lifestyle. Now, what does that mean? Travel more? If you want to. Uh, I think Sister touched on this a couple of weeks ago. 
we have to be as concerned about the economies, we have to be as concerned about the environment in other countries far away as we are about our own. And our consciousness, we have to increase our own consciousness on these issues. That gets into the rights and responsibilities issue. We can't remain isolated as Catholics. We have to be concerned with what's going on in South America, what's going on in Africa, what's going on in Mexico, what's going on in the European countries. That has to concern us. Now, it may mean that there's no defined action that you can do in your parishes. I'm certainly not talking about that. But tuned in to the issues, knowing what's going on, not being apathetic. What's the opposite of it? Apathetic is pathetic? No, it's not pathetic. <laughs> Experience the shalom with creation. If you, in your spirituality class with Sister Bethany, right? Mm -hmm. Sister Bethany. Yeah. You talked about different prayer styles, and I talked about a little bit too, about being a contemplative, uh, being a reflective prayer person, being being a person whose, whose prayer style is meditative, then it probably isn't too hard for you to make this connection to nature, to take that long walk uh, in the country or along a path, a peaceful path, uh, and, and, and meditate on the, on the beauty of creation. But for others, it doesn't come as natural. Sometimes prayer comes in written form, and that's what people feel comfortable with. If you're going to live it out, if you're going to live Catholic social teaching out, then you've got to make that connection with creation. You've got to begin to appreciate the gifts that God gives us. And then you can get a better appreciation for what we have done to destroy a lot of those gifts, perhaps. But we've got to be tuned into that. That's, that's really important. Um, living it out is simple. Uh, Certainly, in Jesus, love is why we're here. I mean, there is there's no other purpose for God to have created humankind other than to love each other. However, free will gets in the way a lot. Free will, free choice. Keep this in the conceptual and not in the practice. And sometimes, you know, look at evolution. You know, are we evolving? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought this was a cool little slide. Here we are right back on the over <laughs> at the screen. <laughs> and so we as Catholics, something to consider is that our lifestyle be simplified. That we have a fairly good grasp on what faithful living is. And that we find through that it, it really isn't all that complicated. Faithful living is not as complex as we sometimes think it is. So, I like this. I had this on a poster. Uh, human rights is an anti-terrorism strategy that works. Uh, when we look at the media today, as Catholics, as ministers, there is this tendency to be drawn into the argument, to be drawn into the polarization that happens each and every day. Turn on any of you know CN, NBC, or or CNN, or any of the news things, and, and Fox is a great one. And look at what what you're watching. You know, you want to know the news, but what you're getting is opinion. All right, you're not getting a reporting of the news maybe the way it used to be. If you as a person want to tune in and say, I want to know what's going on in the world today, you can sort of do that by going to the paper and going into the online uh, news agencies and all that kind of stuff. But you're going to get a lot of opinion. It's not going to be straightforward facts. As Catholics, you say, well, if, if I get suckered into that alienation, polarization that happens in our news, 
then I might miss the most simple of points is that people need food, clothing, and shelter. Everybody. We all need access to resources. If we don't have those things, if we can't guarantee those things, bad things happen. Human history has always taught us that. Does it not? But if you get suckered into the arguments that transpire on some of this stuff, then you can quickly find yourself as a faithful Christian, but drawing the distinction between deserving and undeserving poor. You start drawing the lines. Now you're qualifying who should be fed, who should be clothed, who should get access to the resources, and who, who should not. Sister Donna spoke to this very well, I thought, on Saturday, and she always does. But when we, we draw those kinds of lines, are we really Catholic? And are we really tuned in to Catholic social teachings? Because nowhere in Catholic social teaching does it give you the right to qualify deserving from undeserving poor. Poor is poor. Those without are without. We, we have a mandate to make sure that we have a just system. So if you watch the media, um, you'll find this argument play out a lot, a great deal. So just be cautious on, on that one, I say. Um, just some food for thought before we take a break here. Think of examples of people you know who practice the principle of solidarity. You don't have to yell their names out, but do you truly know people? You say, well, I know what those people stand for, and their actions reflect what they stand for, and they're trustworthy. What do you think of those people? I think they're great. I love them very much. And I like them. It is really who we are as church, or who we should be as church, who we like to think we are as church, but who we're not always as church. And so we have to be, be cautious about that, that we're just not one hand holding the Bible. And the other hand holding the sword or going under whatever. Anything else? Any? We have on this, um, if I mind saying something. On that, uh, what is that? I, I, ICS, IS. ISIS. Yeah, ISIS. There's this thing on uh, Facebook, and I shared it because I thought it was pretty, pretty neat. And it was how um, Jesus' disciples are coming for you, and they're not coming with guns, and they're not. It's, they're coming with love. And then, it, and then mm -hmm. it shows when they beheaded like some of those people, and they said these are his ones that are, these are his disciples of love. Well, no, yeah. it's really, it's really, really nice. Well, and I think, you know, we, we live in a world today yeah. where, you know, I define my religious freedom as being able to blow up your church, you know. I mean, my religious freedom is about my religious freedom. It isn't, it isn't about yours, whatever you believe. And uh, until we get off of that, I, I quite honestly don't, don't see where we're going to make a lot of progress. What I don't understand about that is, um, Aren't they, aren't like, isn't that where the Bible comes from over there? Like, well, the, over there. Over where all the wrong <coughs> fighting is. The Middle East. Yeah, where all the fighting yeah. is. And, uh, and, 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 and what, it, what we're being taught as Catholics and what they're doing over there. What Bible are they reading? Well, they're, they're they're reading not. the Quran. If you're talking about Muslims, they're reading the Quran. But, uh, but isn't the Quran, does the Quran say go rape kids and uh, we'll kill you? Well, no, but, but interpretation. There is it's interpretation. It's that, that feeling of mandate, which we Fun. as Christians have a history of doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that is what I'm saying to you tonight, is if you take Catholic social teaching and very quickly you begin to reformulate that thinking. Uh, not, not, and I'm not getting back to, your, back to your papers again, but some of your papers show an incident happened, I got torqued off about it, and it pushed me to action, and this is what I think ought to be done. And nowhere in there 
Is there any citation of what scripture tells you or what your church tells you or any reference to any of the documents of the church? When you go off that way, you always run the risk of becoming detached from faithful action. You know, in, in, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, what did we call those people that, that uh, seemed to have their act together? And, and, and sort of let their faith guide them. What, what do they call them? The priests. No. Martyrs. No. And not, not title. I'm looking at Jesus, Jesus talked about them a lot. The righteous. The righteous. The righteous. That term has changed over time, but the righteous man, look, my faith principles are guiding my actions. That's what a righteous person that's who a righteous person is. And so when we get into these kinds of discussions on Catholic social teaching, we are informed by our faith. Our actions are guided by that faith. How simple is that? If you're guided by your faith, and all your actions came off of what you believed in, that fact you believed in Jesus Christ, you believed in God, you believed... How could any of these things happen? Right? It just wouldn't. But we're not all fueled by the same thing. What did so, you say a righteous person is? Again. A person that's guided by their faith principles and, and beliefs. That's what we, when Jesus talked about the righteous. And you know, it wasn't a bad word, right? Self righteous is, mm -hmm. but righteous is not. Okay, let's uh, let's take a break. Try to, we'll keep it to about ten minutes. And they're off. <laughs> Go girls. <clears throat> we would like to begin with prayer, as every group should, asking the Father through His only begotten Son Jesus to give us the wisdom for our new house of prayer. We're taking three churches mm -hmm. and bringing them in. Speak right up. We're taking three churches and bringing them into one. Okay. The members of our parish council are Tom Levine. Ann Borsellio, Connie Thompson, Tammy Visayo, Rod Roca, and myself, Kathy Bateman. Um, the parish is very small. The number of families that are located in the towns are very, very poor levels. These communities have high unemployment, are dependent on agriculture, but the, the families are um, a farming family and they do not have adequate subsidies to be able to um, feed themselves or the churches for any new um, sponsored organization and things. Um, the, the parish actually has problems paying its bills, uh, decline in the weekly contributions of the parish owner, um, parish people, so that new programs are met with a lot of resistance because the programs itself, the key first thing they look at is a lack of income to produce any new organized situation. Okay. Um, it has come to our attention that a number of illegal immigrants are working on the local farms. Many of them um, are families that, they work 16 hour days and then they sleep and they can't leave the farms. So there's various issues that we need to look at. Um, they're called shadow workers. They're not coming to church because they're afraid that the police enforcement, like troopers, border patrol, so on, will see them there and then arrest them because they came off of the farm. Because the agreements that the farmers have with governments is that um, they stay on the farm. And so that is an issue also that we would like to address and try and work with. Um, we're hoping that um, some of the priests that retire, that may be a Spanish speaking priest, like we have one now that's going to retire, and he speaks Spanish. Well, we could have him also work with us to be able to go to these farms and bring the Eucharist possibly to the people that are there in a house church. Um, again, the main problem would be availability of the pastor, the ability for the pastor to bring communion to them when they're working 16 hour days, and they work in a 24 hour shift, so you are constantly having these people working and it's very difficult to get enough to come to be able to have a mass. Um, let's see. What we, one of the things we looked at was uh, because of the health care situation of them not getting 
enough food because of the poor families, because we, um, we need volunteers to be able to come forward and with their skills turn what we're hoping to be a new program that we would like to do that will not cost money of any. The program would be um, for two members of our new council to be in each one of these churches to go find out in a survey, um, talk to them what they would like to see happen. And one of the things we're hoping that they would like to see happen is to have a farmer's market. Now, the farmer's market, we don't want it to be the usual one because at farmer market, people have to have money to go buy things. So what we're looking at is we want um, administrative people to be able to go out to teens and um, altar servers and so on to bring the new churches with new people. We want to be able to have the market um, trade skills, not money, rotate market to each one of the churches so that you don't have a farmer's market in one spot. You go to each one of the churches so they all feel um, no threat. They're all involved in this is one community situation, not three separate churches. Um, new programs uh, request service exchange for money. One of the things is, ex an example would be, say a farmer needed his field plowed, okay, that's fine. Well, if this carpenter needed his field plowed, the carpenter could have the farmer go and exchange that duty, and then the carpenter could fix the farmer's roof so that no one's exchanging money, they're putting worth on what they have, and then they're each changing the services for the things that they need and sharing as one family, not just a community, but what do you need, how can we help, and have a table that was at the market where you could actually do that, where someone could sign, I'm a carpenter, this is what we'd like to do. I'm a farmer, this is what we can do. So they can actually do that. Now, um, some of the language barriers, as I mentioned before, we want to have a priest be able to come and um, possibly even teach us some words that we could use to say to them so that our young people learn very quickly. They may be taking Spanish in school, so you might be able to get some of the younger people to be able to help with this. Um, the, we're looking to have letters. We want to go to the farmers. We want to go to the sheriff's office. We want to go to a summer and a congressman and actually ask them to change the laws of how they're making these people stay on the farm for freedom of religion. Now, freedom of religion is ours. They're coming into our area to do and work on our farms to produce our food. They should be allowed freedom of religion so that they have a time frame where they can leave, go, have their parish of whatever which one it is, and be ministered to and not be in fear of being arrested because the law has been changed to allow them to go out and off the farm. And we uh, also would like our local priest, um, naturally we expect anything we do to be written and submitted to him so that he can see pitfalls that might be there for him because he's going to be servicing, servicing three churches. But we are going to ask him if he would go to the bishop and ask the bishop in these letters that are being written from these different agencies for change, everybody hopefully in favor of it, that um, the bishop's lawyer, whoever does the legal for everything, when we get our final letters, that we can hand those letters to the bishop's lawyer. He can look at them, approve them, send them back for revision, whatever's necessary, so that we then would be able to make changes for that. And also, the lawyer, if he could give us new changes from IRS, there's all kinds of changes for immigrants and because of the border situation, so that if we can actually have um, the lawyer come through, give us our IRS changes, because some of them can have driver's licenses, or if they can offer an immigrant coming across the border to have a driver's license, Social Security, get money from the welfare for different issues, um, we're hoping that they'll open up and allow the people that are on the farms to also be able to have some freedom of religion and different rights, instead of being locked in to their own farm situation. <laughs> And um, in all of this, depending on um, uh, the priest from the surveying all of this, we would like to have House Eucharistic brought in to be ministered to people. Now, um, 
I didn't, uh, I wasn't as much aware of this as I am now, but lay ministers are allowed, if, if you do not have enough priests to be able to go to three churches plus the farms, that he can allow the host to be brought to a house ministry as um, giving it, not a mass service, but actually bringing the host in so they can receive the Eucharist. So we would like to see some type of immediate movement that way so they could at least worship in their own house if possible. Clarifying questions oh, before I just make a couple observations here. Okay, three observations. A very good job, by the way. Um, like all the groups, you, you were faced with a very difficult situation and one that we have limited information on. It's not based on a lot of experience that we have. But one thing about Catholic social teaching that rings true of your your thought, your process here, your group process is that Catholic social teaching transcends culture, right? So we sometimes are faced with a situation that we have to address cultural diversity and we have to think outside the box because church transcends all of that. And so this group had to deal with the realities proposed by government, but at the same time had to function as church. And so it's interesting from, from your strategies that you not only dealt with the problem that you faced, but you found a way of becoming church to a group that couldn't access church. Now if we go back 300, 400 years in this country, 300 years, let's go back, then we find a time when Catholicism existed in this country without an active priesthood. There were only missionaries. The laity had to build the churches the laity had to essentially function as ministers in the early church in this country. You're finding the same issue here. You're trying to find a way of bringing church to people who can't access church itself. At the same time, and my final point on that that I think is very good with yours, is you're not leaving it at that. You could have just as easily said, okay, we're going to set up a communion service on a rotating basis, and we're going to do this because these poor folks can't get out to church. No, you're not. You're challenging the government. You're approaching authorities. You're trying to change the law. You're trying to right a wrong. You're trying to give them the right of religion, religious freedom. So very well done in the sense of, as a small group, taking a very, very big problem and approaching it as a church and not just a problem-solving group. So very, very well done. I, I like that. So. Nice job. <coughs> Am I shaking? <laughs> um, okay, who's next? Who would like to go next? You want to go with the PowerPoint? Or are you going with, who else is that? We have to pick somebody if nobody volunteers. And, you, and when you have to tell us who you are. I'm Pope Polarius. Pope Polarius the first. Polarius Catholic the first. Church. Pope Polarius the first, and I'm there was only one Pope Polarius. Any Polarity. of my members in my parish? Oh, you're not taping this, sir. Yes. Don't tape this. Stand still. Come I gotta on. get you on camera. Someday there will be some Pope who will be brave enough to take. <laughs> the there you go. Get at the podium. You can make everybody sick. Of that. I'm gonna ask any member in my parish that's on the parish council to feel free to add anything to what I'm about to say. The Spirit leads you. Please help me out. Um, some of the things that our parish faced, before I go into that, I'm going to say a little prayer too because uh, the first three times that we met, or maybe the first couple times we met, I forgot to pray. And I realized how important prayer is. You can't get anything done if you don't pray, right? So, O oh Lord, as we come together as parish council members representing all four parishes, we ask you to please unite us through the power of the Holy Spirit to work for the good of all our fellow parishioners. We ask for your spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, discernment, and counsel to help guide us to make the right decisions for the common good of all our four parishes and its people. We ask this in Jesus' name and through the intercession of our blessed Mother Mary and all the heavenly angels and saints. Amen. 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 Your parish is a newly configured parish, now made up of four parishes in contiguous small town villages. 
Each community is distinctly different but shares some characteristics of that their enrollment is declining and their members are aging out. Each parish used to be able to boast of strong parish programs of faith formation and community service, but these programs have steadily declined. One of the parishes had a food pantry, but is no longer operational. The building is empty and needs repair. In addition, the pastor in the parish of St. Valerius is approaching retirement age, as is the deacon of all four churches. The parish council is a new group comprised of representatives of all four churches and does not know where to begin. We were given a new issue. Uh, our pastor has developed a significant medical problem and has to take leave. There has not yet been a pastor assigned, though there is a priest available to celebrate the weekend liturgies. The council is struggling to develop a shared identity between the four churches, and this is how this has now become more complicated given the absence of a pastoral leader. leader. The deacon is willing to help out, but has limited time to devote to parish leadership. The council feels that it needs to rally around an issue, but is struggling on how to bring the newly merged parish together. So we uh, took time to reflect on some of the problems that we are facing. We just kind of made a list of some of these problems, um, just to get a better idea of what we're looking at. Um, you know, we uh, realize that enrollment is declining, members are aging out, Faith formation and community services have steadily declined. One of the parish food pantries is no longer operational. The building is empty and it is in need of repair. The three other parishes don't even have a food pantry. Our pastor of all four parishes is approaching retirement age, and our deacon of all four parishes is also approaching retirement age. Some of the other issues that we were looking at were pastor, our pastor has developed a medical problem and has to take leave. There had not yet been a pastor assigned. There is a priest available to celebrate the weekend liturgies. Our parish council is struggling to develop a shared identity between the four parishes and has now become more complicated given the absence of our pastoral leader. Our deacon is willing to help out, but has limited time to devote to parish leadership. As a parish council, we the members feel that we need to rally around an issue but struggle how to bring the newly merged parish together. So we. We basically reflected on these problems and we came up with uh, an action plan, put strategies in, in uh, place. And the first thing we wanted to do was inform, we we're going to write a letter to the bishop informing him of the parish needs and concerns. We wanted to let the bishop know what we are doing in ministerial areas of parish planning and outreach to meet these needs and concerns. We also wanted to ask the bishop how he can help us maintain our existing programs and asked the bishop if there is an available priest to be assigned to our parish, and we needed to schedule this priest and it, that is available to say weekend masses at all four parishes. We also wanted to ask the bishop about scheduling lay ministers for week, weekday communion services. The next thing we wanted to do was meet with parishioners from all four parishes and dialogue and come up with a plan for all of these guys. What do we have in common? We need to put aside our differences, <coughs> on taking on the pastoral leadership. We needed to approach former <coughs> parish council members and parishioners of existing problems. What kind of professional people in parishes can give us help? And lay ministers coming into play, we were looking at outreach, outreach work, liturgy planning, communion service, religious education, working with the youth, and faith community. And by the way, uh, most of the members in our, in our parish council are lay ministers representing each parish, which is a good thing. Uh, the other thing we were looking at was a newly configured parish made up of four parishes. Oh, I'm sorry. I just went to the first page. Okay. Okay, we're going to form a task force. And this, this is a, a group that will uh, look into the problem. We wanted to uh, do lessons on, on change because um, we, we know that there are going to be hard times and people aren't going to agree with some of these changes or they might have a, a hard time with it. So we want the, the, the task group to work with the elderly and others to help them understand the change that is coming to try to get everybody to, you know, work together and maybe be more open to what we have to do as a parish to survive. Um, the other thing was we were going to form committees to uh, take care of the shut-ins and patients in nursing homes and hospitals. 
Um, we also wanted to open our parish council meetings to all parishioners of the four parishes um, and talk about the need to consolidate all four parishes in, into one parish because obviously we're going to have to do that down the road. Uh, we wanted to maintain what we already have, educate and recruit, promoting, promoting solidarity amongst parish members. Um, we also wanted to int introduce the task force members who will instruct lessons on change and work with parishioners to help them through the transition period and it would be nice if people knew who they were. Uh, we um, also, with the bishop's approval, you know, realize that we have to schedule lay ministers for communion services during the weekday. Um, we figured, uh, we felt that uh, it's important for us to uh, keep people informed through public announcements, to use public address to inform people such as making announcements from the pul pulpit uh, after mass, uh, in the bulletin, on the radio, using the local paper, and we just wanted to continue to update parishioners via the public announcement sources just to keep them up to date on everything that, that, that's going on, just to let them feel a part of the whole process here. Some of the planning issues that you know, I think that we, we would have eventually encountered uh, would, would have been uh, in need of a, I mean, we realized we're in need of a full-time priest. Um, and um, we realized that we, we obviously have to keep praying that you know, God will grant us a priest in our parish. And we also realize that we have to, there's a need to sell three of the four parish church buildings. And we wanted to use that money to make necessary repairs and expand on outreach programs. But the problem is, is that, um, you know, we want to know, I, I'm sure that uh, there's going to be a little bit of, um, I don't know, ill feelings about this because which church would be most feasible to, to keep open, you know, and people are, aren't going to. There's, there's definitely going to be disagreements there, so I think what we're, we we're looking at was, um, it, you know, try to help the people understand that the building that would be the, uh, the best to use would be the one that's most centrally located for everybody, you know, and easier to get to. Um, we realized, too, that there's going to be trouble selling buildings, um, selling the church buildings, and... Um, selling the church buildings and, and the effect it will have on all the parishioners. Uh, now we're moving into transforming. And uh, I think after going through all this, um, what we're looking at is just to, to, to ask the parishioners to continue to pray for a full-time priest. We want to keep our parishioners in the loop by keeping them informed. Uh, continue to let parishioners be a part of changes made and make use of the task group that will help parishioners through the transition period. And because of the trouble selling church buildings, the parish council has put in place different ways for fundraising. First one we, we thought of was second collection every Sunday will be for outreach programs. Uh, we just wanted to make an announcement asking every member to put at least one dollar for the outreach programs. Then we thought we could have a 50-50 raffle. We would print up our own tickets, save a little money there, and the lay ministers would make copies of the tickets. Uh, the third thing we would do is have bake sales before and after the weekend masses. Any clarifying questions? <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Thanks, guys. When are those churches for sale, by the way? <laughs> um, a, a couple of things here. Um, the first group was really dealing with uh, human dignity and preferential option for the poor and rights and responsibilities. Right? We've got these issues we have to deal with. Uh, these are the marginalized, these are the poor, and so we've got to address their needs. As church, we have to come to their aid and assistance. Second group, though, is dealing with a whole other set of issues. They're dealing with subsidiarity and solidarity. Um, very good job at bringing in solidarity first. The first thing you have to do is you've got to get people in agreement with what the problem is, what you're faced with. And then, what I also liked about your presentation is you, you brought people together and you were trying to figure out ways that you can engage more people into solving the problem. Subsidiarity. How do we keep those decisions 
at, at the, the appropriate level. Yes, you're going to write to the bishop, but you weren't writing to the bishop saying, we don't know what we're doing down here. Uh, you, no, you were writing for permissions to say, okay, we want you to participate <coughs> with us, but we are on it. We're working on this. We have begun some action. Essentially, you're functioning as a pastoral team, and you're asking for the bishop to recognize you as such. All right? You have a sacramental priest, but that doesn't address the absence of a pastor and who provides leadership to you. One thing about Catholic social teaching, and particularly uh, subsidiarity, is that without a pastoral leader, you have to rise to the occasion and become that leader. Now, whether that's in a shared group, <clears throat> or whether that's in an appointment, or whether that's through, as you decided to do, I think, pull your councils together, your parish councils together, uh, you, are, you are making some decisions at the appropriate level which is, was really neat. However, here's the thing about church. When we get into subsidiarity, let us not uh, mislead ourselves into thinking that all issues are pertinent to the parish and can be made at the local level. When you get into selling church buildings, that gets tricky. Because the parish owns that property, but you still need diocesan approval to sell those. There has to be a council of priests that meets and approves all that kind of stuff. So, so the main thing is that as lay ministers, and undoubtedly this is a scenario that has played out and will play out more in the future probably, uh, understand what your role is and when you're making recommendations and when you're exploratory with some of these. Because uh, understand there is, a, there is a diocesan structure and, and sometimes subsidiarity gets overtaken by, by what the ecclesial structure is. And that's not a criticism, that's just a, a reality of how things, how things operate. So I thought it was a very good job of, of bringing those two issues in and, uh, and dealing with it. Nicely done. Any questions before we go to the third group? And the third group is? We'll go next. Okay. Let's take it. All right. I'm going to hope I catch this. <laughs> and you're not just going to throw their yeah, stuff on the floor. Do you mind if I use your cat in a hat? No, go right ahead. <laughs> I can't. Do you want me to take that down? No, no, that's fine. Room? That's fine. I thought he was going to get up there and just throw it off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Our group, we're called the Holy Mackerel Catholic Church. <laughs> There's myself and Randy and Gloria and Pat and Mary Ann and Michelle. And we, our parish has recently become merged with two, uh, we, we have a, with two other parishes to form our larger community. Our parish is a nice medium sized church that's well supported on the generous giving of the parish members. The two churches that we are, have been, been merged with are smaller, poor communities with largely black and Hispanic populations. Uh, so we and, and we have combined the parish council already. So we've got a nice representative group of, of people from that, that came from all three churches. But we have been accused by the people, mostly from the smaller churches, of being unsensitive to their cultural differences. And on top of that, the pastor has decided that he wants to change the mass schedule and have one mass at each church. Normally there was just, he was the pastor here, two masses on the weekend. Now he's going to have a mass at each church, one Saturday evening, early Sunday, and later Sunday. And he also wants to take the choir and combine it into one choir and have them sing at the last mass on Sunday only. So, and he has come to us and asked him to help him develop strat strategies that will make this a smooth, problem-free transition. So, some of the problems that you can see we're dealing with is, is race, cultural differences, and, and people are very upset that they've had to combine with our church, and, and so there's a lot of animosity in the groups. So, our strategies, Got together, 
And here are, here are some of our strategies. First, we, first, obviously, we're going to pray, both individually and as a group, when we meet. What we're going to do is we're going to hold listening sessions at all three churches. The parish council, as a group, will go to each church, set up a time, and we'll have listening sessions. And we'll let the parishioners come to us with problems that they may, that they may have or with concerns that they may have. And then we're going to take that information back and act on it, and dwell on it and act on it. We're going to develop welcoming groups at each church. And, and by the way, when, when people come to the listening sessions, we're going to encourage them to, to check out Mass at the other churches. You know, just go to the other church once in a while, any at the other two churches, just to see the Mass so you can be recognized. And we're going to set up welcoming groups so people can, when, in, and I've talked to other people that have had welcoming groups, you, you, you get people that are interested in wherever they normally sit in that section of the church. If somebody happens to sit in there that they don't know or they don't recognize, you, you after Mass, you greet them and you welcome them into the church. I think that will go a long ways to help with, with, with not, not only solidarity, but also with the, with the fact that we have been, you know, we've been accused of being insensitive to cultural differences. If we can get other people to go to the different masses, we can recognize them and greet them at, at the church. We'd also like to develop a social committee. If there isn't one at one of the churches, we'll, we'll try to get a combined social committee. And then we're going to see if we can have, at, at once a month, at, rot at rotate the churches, see if we can have coffee or something after mass. Just and invite people, the, the people from the welcoming committee, committee we'll invite those that are at the at after mass to to come to the to come to the coffee hour just so we can visit and, and meet people. We're we're going to meet with the, the respective choir directors from each church, and we're going to direct them to combine the choirs. We we think that they can that the, the three of them together, knowing their choirs as well as they do, that and and, and it's, this is going along the lines of a of subsidiarity principle where we'll let them decide on, on, on and, and let them develop the, a combined choir. We'll let them decide the repertoire because these, being, being cultural differences at these various churches, they may do different, different types of, of music at the black church or at the Hispanic church. And so these guys know that repertoire and they can get that together and we hope that we can get a nice, a nice uh, selection of music. And then we're going to go to the pastor and we're going to suggest that using the principle of solidarity with him, and, and in the interest of having a smooth transition, we'd like to have the choir sing at a different mass each Sunday. Instead of the last mass every Sunday, which is going to be at the big church most likely, <laughs> we're not going to switch the masses around every Sunday, but if we can get the choir to sing at a different mass, and so when they sing at the, at the church that's mostly Hispanic, they can sing a selection of their music that they like, and, and the same with the other churches. So that's, that's pretty much, we, we, we feel that it would be, it would be uh, appropriate to the church's cultural heritages to have a nice selection of different musics at, at a mass. We'll rotate those, mat, those the choir to a different church each Sunday. So that's where we're at. Any clarifying questions for Steve or for the group? No, because he just answered mine. I, I was thinking, are they, they going to sing at the, at the big church? Yeah. You know, but then he said they're going to rotate. I think it's a good idea to have them rotate, though, yeah. because mm -hmm. then it, that way it, it does keep everybody happy. You know? Yeah. Um, you got to respect well, their cultural ahead. heritage, you know, and let them... Get it's a real problem because Whoopi Goldberg dealt with this very same problem. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 That's right. Look how she did. The Pope was there watching her right. sing. <laughs> In all seriousness, the, the choir, and I, and I really like this, what you did with your group, the choir becomes metaphor for the church, doesn't it? Yeah. In other words, we're looking at the social justice issue of family, community, and participation here. And so you've got some cultural issues here um, that exist. There has to be a way of bringing some unity to the church. And the choir becomes 
the, the metaphor for the church, and it becomes opportunity for the church to come together. Uh, and I, I did have a chance to sit in on your group. There's a social justice issue. Your analysis has to come first. And very quickly, your group came to the conclusion that if we, if we go beyond this choir issue, if we skip over this, that's so rooted in the history of the parish, then we'll miss the whole point here of how do we become church? How do we recognize the folks that have, have really been dedicated to that choir? And it's interesting, you, you found a way of doing it. But that's only if the pastor agrees, so do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. I'm easy going, you know? I thought I was a pastor who was out on medical leave, but I guess I'm not. Uh, but these are, they, this is going to be the challenge moving forward for our parishes because we are so used to taking direction and taking leadership. And now along come you guys in commissioned lay minister roles and being expected to participate. Uh, at, at secondary levels of leadership within your parishes, and these are the very kinds of things that you have to be talking about within your parish councils, is how do we bring this stuff together? Because, because you can be divisive and decisive. <laughs> you can then say, well, too bad. We can't, we can't afford to have a choir that, uh, that does what it used to do, and, and, and it all kind of falls apart. So, so it really does require uh, a prayerful analysis, if you will, a prayerful reflection on some of these issues. And uh, again, like the other groups, I think you did a, a, a terrific job on that. So, good job. Okay, so our last last group. Let me set this up. We've got to start this up because. All of the groups, um, you had to figure out where to bring prayer into the process, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Sometimes it's so Definitely. easy to jump in and start making decisions and analysis, and you haven't even so much as asked the Holy Spirit for help. And uh, I, was, I was impressed that by week two, you guys were, were sort of understanding of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, get this set up. i got to change the source. I don't think it'll read it down, so. Lisa, you can use that cat in the hat pointer. Can I? Yes. <laughs> it's great. Nothing like it. All right. Let me just make sure it loads up here. Go uh, right to left. Right to left. Okay. Try that. First of all, this is all new technology. I have yeah. a dumb phone. <laughs> <laughs> no smartphone for me. Uh, um, I'd like to thank our group. Uh, we we struggled a little bit. <laughs> Probably the first three weeks, <laughs> but we get it all together. Uh, our, pa our parish is Our Lady of Perpetual Motion. <laughs> our leader? It used to be Perpetual Agony. <laughs> our leader is Darren. Thank you, Darren, for being the leader. <laughs> it was a struggle. <laughs> our members are Rosemary and Donna and Laura. And Linda, myself, and Darren. Our parish description, we're located in an urban area. It has a large number of registered families. Many of the parishioners are faculty at one of the three universities in town. It has had several successful giving campaigns, also has endowments and financial resources. The council has focused on faith formation, adult education. Oops, we're a little behind here. <laughs> there you go. And RCIA. 
There are no distinct programs that serve the poor, and some of our parishioners have suggested the parish address larger, more global social issues. And the parish has solid fiscal connections and relationships with the local universities. <clears throat> the Parish Finance Council met and reviewed the endowments. And, uh, oh, go back. and they determined that some of the money has been allocated for programs for the poor and the disenfranchised. Uh, the allocated funds should be used for startup and ongoing funding for a soup kitchen or a food pantry program. But the parishioners feel that since the parish is located in a rather upscale location, the programs for the poor are not a good fit. Now struggling with how to develop programs without creating tension in the parish because it has not dealt well, dealt with the poor before. Our problem as a parish is that we have money that is to be used, it's dedicated for the poor and the disenfranchised, but these individuals are not living within our parish boundaries. So, <laughs> the opportunity that we have, how do we determine which community programs and or neighboring parishes will benefit from our abundant resources. We have some proposed strategies. The first one is to form a prayer group to meet weekly and pray for the solution to our problems. We're going to look into zoning regulations and requirements for a soup kitchen or a food pantry. We're going to educate our parishioners on Catholic social justice regarding the treatment of the poor by holding informational meetings and training on solidarity and social justice issues. We're going to survey our parishioners and ask for suggestions on how we can help the poor. We're going to ask for committee volunteers for fact gathering on surrounding parishes and organizations to establish what their needs are. We're going to ask the colleges for their assistance. And we think that the colleges will be an important resource for the parish and it is a great way to keep our younger generation involved. Even though the students may not, they're temporary members of the community, they are the future of our church no matter where they eventually settle down. Our continued proposed strategies, we want to identify any other resources that are already available. We're going to develop steps to enable the people that we serve who are in the poverty cycle to break out of the bonds that hold them there. And we're going to ask the colleges for assistance. And we feel that the colleges are, are important. And I've already said that. <laughs> but, um, the professors can also contribute by supporting and encouraging the programs through their campus life. They can also help us to administer surveys. And whatnot. Um, we also had some notes um, uh, for ideas that may help the oppressed to break the bonds of poverty. We could use the students to help organize classes for those needing tutors for their GEDs. We can provide sitters or daycare for children so that the parents can attend study classes and or work, and we're going to ask par parishioners to volunteer to provide training skills for resume writing, interviewing, dressing for job interviews, and offering them possibly positions in their own uh, businesses. And does anybody have any questions? Because my group will be glad to help. <laughs> <laughs> How much of that cash we have left over? <laughs> Do you guys want to buy any of our buildings? Do you guys want to buy any of our buildings? You have a used pantry, right? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> you buy that too? <laughs> stock it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you want to stock it. Buy one, get one free sale. <laughs> That's a cash. <laughs> Very well done. Um, nope. I, I think um, all of the groups have had to deal with, with uh, a variety of Catholic social justice issues. Your group, in particular, had to deal with a, 
sort of a unique one in the sense that you had resources of your own. You were in an upscale area, you had uh, sufficient resources to run your parish, but you had dedicated funds that had to be used for a population that you did not serve. All right. So I thought you were very creative in, in bringing in the college community that you did and looking, looking at, which it didn't say on your printout, but I said in at your group last week, that you began looking at those folks as human capital, essentially, that they can help with the issue, particularly students who were at one point talking about internships and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and, and I thought that was particularly interesting. The, the other thing is that you were using the college university and the university to raise the consciousness of the social justice problem that in your parish you didn't have, but you had financial resources dedicated to solving uh, or at least addressing the problem. I think if you look across all four of your groups, you were given problems that were not necessarily insurmountable but they were different than, than you had uh, dealt with in the past. I can tell you, in coming up with those scenarios, they're based on real issues that I'm familiar with. Not in our diocese, but across the country and some of the research that I was doing a few years ago came across these actual situations. And, uh, and so you, you, these, these things do happen. Here's the bottom line, I think, that all of you find, that to be church, to truly be church, sometimes, in fact, most often, we have to think outside the box. We are constrained by our own rules. We are constrained by the ways that we operate. For example, just using uh, the last group, haven't we dealt with this issue before where upscale or, or, or resource-rich parishes have sponsored projects in third world countries? All right. They have used their money to put in water plants and, and uh, uh, sanitation <coughs> plants and all of these kinds of things in third world countries. They found a way of being church and breaking out of, of those fetters or, or those binds that, that keep you thinking locally. So in some ways that, that looks like it flies in the face of subsidiarity, yet you are making decisions at a local level for a much larger issue. Uh, the, the same thing with the group, with your choir, all right? You're dealing with a much larger issue. You're dealing with racism, discrimination. You're dealing with cultural issue, uh, cultural deprivation kinds of things. And so you have to function as church, don't you, to, to break out of that. Um, so I thought all of the, the, the groups, all four of the groups did a wonderful job of moving through a process that we're going to reflect on next week called the pastoral cycle. And that I'm hoping that as we close this course out, you're able to go forward with that lens kind of, kind of operating at all times in, in your head that says, I see a problem. How do I deal with this? All right? Common secular operating uh, mode is to complain about it, right? I mean, the first thing to do about a social problem is to complain about it. How did anybody let this happen? How did this, whose fault is this, you know? We've all got to, and that's what we do. We spend an awful lot of energy trying to find out who's behind this, you know, what this problem is. As Catholics, we, we can't waste our time and energy on that. We, we've got to look at solutions. We, we've got to look at how we move forward with our Catholic thinking, with our Christian beliefs and, and resolve some of these issues. And, and to do that means we've got to cast the blame game aside. And we've got to look at a problem in a theologically reflective way. Okay, so I pray about the issue first and foremost. That's, that's my first strategy. But my analysis of that issue comes from my faith. It comes from my, the faith that I have and my informed uh, reason using those faith scripture, my Catholic background, etc. And then finally, that moves me into action. But that action cannot take place unless I come to those decisions within a community, right? 
can't just do it myself. I have to I have to work with others, and then that brings you to a prayerful action. And next week, when we finish our dinner, we'll go briefly through how that pastoral cycle works, and then you'll say, oh, that's just what we did, I think, the last three or four weeks. That's how we were teaching ourselves to think. So, so that'll be next week. So, um, <clears throat> next week, same time, same place, prayer at 6, dinner at 6.30, uh, reflection at about uh, 7.15, give or take, and we'll probably get done a little bit. For those of you that didn't turn your papers in, please get those to me. Your self-reflection fours, get those to me. And are there any questions? Before we break Let's close with the Our Father. Right? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.